What's, what has been the main challenges for you in developing talents in Ghana and Nigeria specifically? Um, I believe um, both markets are um, kind of um, different, uh, even though they are in close proximity, both in uh, SSA. Um, I think um, Nigeria has a very mature market when it comes to oil and gas uh, in terms of uh, personnel. Um, Crude oil was first discovered in Nigeria in the 50s. Uh, in, since then, you've had Nigerians working in the oil and gas industry. Um, I don't think there's a problem with uh, finding talent. Um, I would say the problem is more of keeping that talent uh, because once they achieve a certain level of um, experience, they are globally mobile and you are then competing against uh, uh, what's applicable elsewhere in the world. Um, that may be different in Ghana. Um, if we do have a problem with uh, talent, um, it may be for entry level, um, entry level, um, but we have a huge uh, resource base and I think you can always find the people to fill uh, whatever uh, spots or vacancies you have um, in Nigeria. I'm speaking specifically about Nigeria now. Uh, Ghana may be different. I know Chris Mills from Ghana. Good evening now. Um, okay, yeah, you're right. Nigeria is more matured when it comes to the talent space as compared to Ghana. However, when it comes to identifying the talent and growing the talent in both locations, whereas in Ghana, the talent is very limited. Nigeria, the mobility of the talent is very fluid in the sense that, as you said, as soon as they come in, the expectation is so wide, and also the, the local stakeholders makes it challenging and want an expedite training in developing them. Sometimes I feel they seem to neglect the kind of industry we work in to understand that it takes a while to develop that talent to the level in order to take over what they're supposed to do for the organization. So there's an expectation from the national stakeholders that you need to expedite the development and the training. Now that doesn't mean that you can't attract the talent. The talents are there in Nigeria. When it comes to Ghana also, when it comes to the um, training part, the undergraduate, you have the talent there. Again, because it's of the industry, the national stakeholders expect you to develop them at a very fast rate, which we all know in this industry, experience counts. And you don't expect the person to have the experience, especially the offshore experience overnight. It takes time to build experience. So that is the dynamics in the two different locations that we have. There's one industry where you have the mature talent there and they want to come in and they want to do everything that you expect from them and they expect you to take them to a level without taking time to actually get there. Whereas in the other um, economy or the other country, the talent is not there. The little talent that is there, they expect to be grown at a very fast rate. So it makes it very, so there's two different dynamics. One is matured, one is not matured, and all of them want a very fast development rate. And it's very challenging in making sure that you meet the expectations of the local state and stakeholders as far as I'm concerned. If I can ask uh, our Nigerian colleagues here, what do you think has been the success of getting, yeah, today you can find talents in Nigeria. Do you feel this is because the, the, the operators or the service industry has actually been providing for the last 50 years or more the, the training, the development to the people, or is that because the, the government, the authorities actually played it played its part in putting universities in place with degrees which would provide reservoir engineers, petroleum engineers, so individual that were directly ready for the industry. So do you think it's been the industry that has been doing their, their part of the game or has it been driven by, by the authorities, by, by the government and, and the universities? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think because one of the reasons is because, you know, Nigeria is a very big country. And apart from that, there are a lot of uh, oil companies in the country. 
and which has been an advantage, a very great advantage for the country, whereby we have a lot of resources, you know, and all these resources have been, you know, utilized at every angle and at every level. More so, based on what he said, we observe that quite a number of companies equally engages in what we call training. There are a lot of trainees that is being engaged by all these uh, community workers and they empower them. And through all these activities and the trainees they engage in, it helps to increase the, the space in what we are talking about. Thank you. Hello? Yes. So um, we have different uh, legislation that guides um, recruitment in um, Nigeria and I'm sure Ghana. So there's a local, gov uh, local content uh, law in Nigeria and I'm sure there's one, I know there's one in Ghana as well. All right, and it requires you to train a certain number of locals to match the experts you have in uh, those countries. So that has helped a lot. Okay, um, one of the other things that has helped is um, uh, the universities. Okay, there are a lot of private universities now based on the legislation, and uh, that helps uh, to bring a lot of access to a lot of um, young people in these countries. All right, so you're getting more quality in terms of um, the standard of education that they get. Okay, um, the um, so I, I think those two points uh, really, really kind of help um, bring a lot of difference when it comes to uh, legislation to support um, growing of talents in uh, both Nigeria and Ghana. Uh, local content, again, if we expand it further to look at um, what it, it takes in terms of uh, company setup, um, I believe uh, one of our presenters talked about partnership with local vendors and local companies. It's a requirement for you as an IOC or international body to partner with these local companies. Uh, there's transfer of knowledge to them. They recruit more locals, okay? Um, the challenge on that aspect is that um, there's still a bit of struggle in terms of um, their structure of training, okay? But they're catching up, and that's the good part. Uh, the transfer of knowledge has helped a lot. Um, training is becoming mandatory. The IOCs are uh, maintaining their level of service quality and uh, the challenge is there for every local company to step up and um, meet up with the uh, international standard, which they are also measured by. Uh, just to chip in, in, I mean, just to add to what um, Wally just said, um, uh, I, I think both parties uh, can share in uh, the success story or in some of the blame that we experience. Um, so when an, an international company, IOC, comes into Nigeria, uh, they expect to see a resource base, right? Uh, so we do have um, colleges where um, people specialize in petroleum engineering. Uh, we have uh, technical institutes uh, like the PTI in Wari Petroleum uh, Training Institutes. So we have lots of people coming out, you know, ready to get into the industry. Um, and I can speak for Chevron. Um, I've been in Chevron for uh, over 10 years. Uh, I can speak to the effort which is made to develop talent. Uh, we have uh, career development plans. Uh, so, so you came into a company like uh, Chevron, um, you, you, your career is mapped out. You can tell where you're gonna be in uh, five years. So there's commitment uh, on the part of, uh, of the companies uh, to development. Uh, and I think um, we also have that uh, on the part of, of the government. Um, a little more can be done on both sides, uh, but I think we're trending in the right direction. So, so when you look at the success of Nigeria in terms of availability of talents, and when we look at whether it's Angola, whether it's Ghana, if we look at the, the other countries that have got um, relatively su sufficient mass of work that, that could actually require local workforce, would you say that the success of Nigeria, it's because of these colleges that have been coming up, or is it because of Chevron, provi uh, who actually provided you some training? Um, do we ask the regulator to say, well, you need to put money into the colleges, into the universities, or 
you keep asking the IOCs or the service business to actually come with their uh, school bag and, and books. So, so um, colleges can only do so much. Um, who would you rather have sitting on your well? Would you rather have a fresh graduate who has a first class degree? Or would you rather have um, a high school um, graduate with 20 years of experience sitting on your well? I guess that's, that's a difference between experience and knowledge. And uh, uh, here, yeah, you're obviously, the, the question is, who, is, who has the responsibility to provide education? And, um, or, no, actually, it's not a question of who has the responsibility, but what makes it successful for Nigeria? What makes it that today, any investor that comes to Nigeria, he knows that he's going to find the people. The people are there. Not just because it's 200 million Nigerians, yeah. but because they are, because not 200 million Nigerians have yeah. got the, the, the education required for this industry. Well, okay, so I worked in Nigeria. Uh, I've traveled a bit. Uh, I've worked in the US. And everywhere I've been, um, I've met Nigerians who are working at the highest level all over the world. Uh, many of those people started out in Nigeria. I don't think finding the people is the problem. I do understand your point uh, that you can have a situation where there are millions of people, but you do, I mean, uh, too many, uh, there are lots of people, but no talent. But I do not think that's the problem um, in Nigeria. I believe that if there's any company that wants to um, set up base in Nigeria, they will find the people. No, absolutely. Uh, yeah. that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. When you go to the other West African countries, yeah. how the other, the, the okay. industry in Nigeria, Absolutely, okay. all the talents are here. Yeah. And as you said, we also find them mm -hmm. outside of Nigeria. Yeah. Um, but if we go to Angola or, or all the other booming oil and gas countries, yeah. then the same story is not there yet. Yeah. Is this because they, they haven't reached that maturity? Is this because the, the colleges don't exist, the mm -hmm. universities don't exist? Um, where do you see, and that's where I'm asking, how would you say that's the reason why Nigeria is successful? Yeah. That's why you've got Nigerians everywhere in the world okay. um, at the highest level. Yeah, yeah I, I get your point. I, I think it has to do with the uh, maturity of uh, the country in terms of oil and gas. Um, uh, uh, so I, I think there's a role for both parties to play. Um, there's a huge role for governments to play in terms of um, developing uh, the manpower. Um, we're moving into knowledge economies, right? Any, any country that's not developing its people uh, is just going to get farther and farther behind. Um, but I do think that uh, there's a role for uh, the companies to play um, because um, by regulation, just like Wally said, by regulation, you do have to employ locals. If the locals are not trained, um, that's bad for business. Okay, so, so what can we do as um, private companies? We can lobby, uh, we can help to um, encourage um, uh, you know, development of people, uh, not just within the companies, but without um, encouraging uh, uh, the government to set up uh, maybe research institutes or training institutes uh, so that you have a steady uh, supply of personnel who, who, who are trainable and who you can absorb easily into, your, into the system. Uh, maybe to add to what you just said, you will equally observe some years back, Shell divest some of their um, um, assets, especially in the eastern region. Almost all the assets in the swamp was divested. I was happy to hear one of the presenters here from Eritor is part of the uh, asset that was divested from Shell, where you have Aoba, Ekulama, and uh, Kula. You know, this is an asset initially belonging to Shell. Now, if you look at the, the setup of the company, basically most of the workers, they are all local workers from country. And not Eroton again, we also have some in area like uh, Nembe, 
community. That one too was divested to another local contractor. Now, you begin to wonder how come that even at the local level, a company like Shell can, is a part of their asset to a local content. And yet, they're operating very well. It's not like they have any issue. I think one of the major reasons here is because, like my other guys have said, when you involve the communities enough training, they will be able to manage all these assets. And then they will go fine. That's why today I was happy when I had him you know, make a presentation because it's part of an asset that was divested by Shell. So you can see that it's a growing environment for us. Thank you. Um, okay, Guillaume, um, the question is mainly staked in on the fact that Nigeria seems to be flourishing when it comes to the nationals doing well in majority of the service and IOC companies. That's a fact. And the fact is purely because of one, there's the local content in Nigeria is, is strong in the sense that the local stakeholders play a part in the development, they take an interest in it, and they ensure that they try and implement the laws. And also, there's a majority of, majority of the universities which produces technical people, which you can actually draft into your organization and develop them. And again, as Ifo said, the talent outside Nigeria is, a, is huge when it comes to Nigeria are working outside. And as I said, we've benefited from it. Now, when you go to the rest of the sub-Saharan countries, let me take, for example, Angola. The base, which is the technical training, the local stakeholders needs to improve on making sure that there's enough training universities, institutions that will produce the right talent for the likes of the IOCs and the service companies to be able to tap into those talents and actually attract them. Now, for example, in Expo two, three years ago, we had to, to actually attract Angolans into sub, um, Expo. We had to go to South Africa, where we had to participate in a career fair because we realized that the Angolans are training outside Angola, in Cape Town and in Johannesburg. And yes, we got the right talent. You will get the right talent, and those talents will be developed to the right level as expected in the organization, and we managed to do that. Going forward, we've also decided that instead of actually going into outside Angola, let's see if we can partner with the universities in the country to see whether we can do that and involve the national stakeholders like the Sunnels and the rest to make sure that they can work with us to attract the right talent and develop them into that. That is some of the things that the national stakeholders need to get involved in more in order to make sure that the right talent are available in most of these countries by making sure that the basis, which is the training, is there. And as he said, if I get an, um, an engineer who's just come out of um, university for one year, I say again, somebody who's been in a service company or an oil and gas company with 10 years experience, who would I go for? Would I go for an experience or would I go for a training? Obviously, I'll go for an experienced person. However, to get the experience, you need to have the training in order to get there. And I think that's where we have to work more with the local stakeholders to get there. Yeah, um, I'd like to add a few more points. Um, to elaborate on what Shekun said about uh, security, uh, where there's no security, there can't be any positive economic uh, growth. Uh, an, an example is Wari, right? Um, used to very, be a very bubbling city, a lot of activities. And you know where oil workers are, there's a lot of money being spent, okay? And uh, during the um, crisis, a lot of them left, a lot of the companies left, and um, it's not the city it was before, all right? So security is very key um, in, uh, as in uh, being a challenge if there's no security. An ex another example is in northern Nigeria where there's Boko Haram. A lot of people are not sending their kids to school in the north again. Um, one more point is um, millennial hyperactivity, all right? We have a lot of the young guys who don't want to spend time learning. They just want to grow so fast, all right? And um, they want to hop from company to company, all right? All after the monetary gains rather than um, the joy of um, learning, okay? 
and um, that also is a challenge we face in recruiting and um, retaining. Um, I think um, the third point I have is a generational gap, okay, because there's been a lot of attrition, all right? Um, that passage of knowledge from one generation to the other is, uh, is lacking, all right? The history you, you gain, the, the knowledge you gain, the experience, the expertise is not adequately passed to the next generation, and uh, we have uh, um, that as a challenge as well. Thank you. Um, Adi, just to touch on the minera. You see, we all talked about these different generations every now and then. However, as an organization, and I'm talking from an HR perspective, we need to know the generations that are up and coming. And we know that current generations, they like to grow fast. So how do we come up with strategies to enable them to develop quickly and grow in the organization quickly? As long as we are able to put in strategies to develop that, it makes it easier for you to retain them. Now, I'll give you a typical example. We have a few in Ghana that we've just um, recruited from the, um, for, into our graduate scheme. And to be honest with you, my managers can testify to it. They're looking into the future. They're looking at becoming the next generation managers, but they don't want to just be stagnating. They want to go do it very fast. They want to go. So we needed to put in an acceleration scheme to get them there, which included mentoring and which included also making sure that there's a body system to get them to the right level. So you, as long as the people agenda looks at the generation, as long as the opportunities in the organization, you will be able to meet the right, attract the right people and retain the right people. And it is a problem, yes. I'm not saying it's not. But it is. But the people agenda needs to address that in order to develop them to the next level. And I think in Expo currently we're trying to do that to a very high level. I, I totally agree with you. It's about um, um, you know adapting to um, the future, and they are the future. All right. We need to find ways of attracting them and retaining them. Uh, it's a challenge, but it's something we we need to address. Sorry, let me just chip in something here that has been a tremendous change in Nigeria, especially in the aspect of marine logistics. You might wonder how or why there is a drop in the rate at which Nigerians go for foreign vessels, tugboats, barges, houseboats. I have in my laptop there, I will have showed you that in Nigeria today, especially in Port Harcourt, you go to most of the jetties in Nigeria, you see a lot of people building barges, tugboats, houseboats, and they are being engaged, you know. Now, but the only challenge with all this locally made tug and the houseboat is um, certification. When all these equipment are being built, do they have specification? Are they built to specification? Do they have a design? But it's a starting point. But I'm, as, I'm, as I'm talking to you now, most of this equipment are being used in all our facilities. And you know, in share, we so much believe in equipment being certified before it can be used. So we ensure that whatever equipment that is being built, either in the local yard or wherever, you take it to the statutory uh, body that certify and then give you the certification for it, whereby then we have another department that goes out for premium. They must ensure that the equipment that you are presenting is fit for purpose. So all this is being done in the local area as part of logistics in Nigeria. Thank you. I don't know if there's any questions in the room in particular to people, resources, so at least I open the, uh, the question to him. Oh, yes. Yeah, I just want to um, contribute to um, the discussion that is on the table at the moment. Uh, one of the basic, uh, which, oh, uh, basic difference between what is happening in Nigeria and in Ghana with respect to 
talent acquisition and then retention of the talent. One is for a fact is the remuneration, right? You have, a, in terms of the salary wise, if you try to benchmark uh, with the sub Saharan Africa, you tend to uh, realize that the, how much the Ghanaians are being paid compared to the industry standard is not comparative. So what tends to happen is that the Ghanaian will get the skills, the know-how, and then when he realizes that he is very competitive, then um, he leaves the country to find greener pasture because it's now uh, marketable as compared to um, the elsewhere in Nigeria and Angola. And the other thing that is also affecting the Ghanaians to develop very fast is the business. Because here in Ghana, we, um, the industry is still growing. We just have only about two, uh, three fields that is producing and virtually producing an average of 200,000 um, barrels of oil per day as compared to um, Nigeria, they are talking about millions of barrels. So in terms of business-wise, I mean, you tend to uh, sometimes support some of the service companies because their business is in Nigeria and they want to develop the talent uh, in, in Nigeria as compared to um, Ghana. So these are some few things that I wanted to add that um, Ghana is now developing in terms of the, the businesses and um, hopefully the regulators and then uh, should come to put uh, strategic plans in place to see how best they can uh, develop their talent in Ghana so that we can match up with the likes of Nigeria and then the other matured uh, countries. Hello, uh, I believe that was uh, Faye, uh, BHG, um, that was talking about uh, Uber and uh, Airbnb, and now apps are ruling the world now. Um, there's an opportunity for us in the industry uh, to create apps uh, or learning um, repositories uh, for people who are maybe coming fresh out of college or even who don't have degrees, uh, where they can easily um, get up to speed on some of the lingo and technology, um, you know, in the industry. Um, I, I think that way we can fill some of the gaps um, that, that you find in, in some of these countries. Free resources online, uh, they're very useful, and that's something I think um, all companies and service companies can, can, um, um, uh, can um, you know, um, um, invest in. Uh, to create uh, the talent in places where they are uh, difficult to come across. Hello everyone, my name is Tim Horsfall, I work for Expo. Uh, one of the main objectives of this panel discussion was to identify the main challenges. And it surprised me that there's one aspect that we've not discussed. So I kind of wanted to present the subject of unionization and unions to our panel and maybe have a little discussion around the subject of unions and are they are unions something positive or are unions uh, a negative to the main challenges of developing talents in uh, specifically to Nigeria and Ghana so I kind of put that challenge to the the panel who is ready for that very controversial question <laughs> well, thanks Tim um, thank you very much Tim um, that's my colleague for you. <laughs> um, unions in itself, in my experience, unions is not supposed to be a negative thing in the sense that unions are there as a mouthpiece to negotiate and discuss things relating to employees. However, in support with management, and as a management team, we're supposed to work with the unions together it's a joint stakeholder meeting. It's not unions against management. And majority of the time, I'm being careful with the way I choose my words from here. We have seen unions in sub-Saharan Africa rather come across as a union against management. Instead of union working with management in the benefit of the organization and their employees. 
Now, throughout my experience, I've worked with different versions of unions, and the unions I've worked with currently in Sub-Saharan Africa, some are different. But unions in itself is not a negative thing. It depends on how they come across. Now, that's why as a company, we need to invest in the development and training of the unions themselves, because it's part of the legislation when it comes to unions. We need to provide time for the employees who are the part of the union team to go on the training that is supposed to be going in order to upscale them to be able to have the conversation which is in the interest of the organization and the employees. If we don't do that, what tends to happen is that we tend to have unions that are being misled, that become militant, and it becomes a challenge for the company to deal with. However, I would take it that in the South Southern Africa, in Expo, we've done our very best in trying to work with the unions and we're still working with the unions. And that's the best way to go with it. Thank you. Um, I personally think, um, and I agree with you, Chris, it's a strategic partnership, just like uh, we've heard earlier from our colleague in uh, BHG. Um, you need to work with them. And you're, you're only as strong as your employees, right? Yeah? You, we, it's, it's a team effort. And um, if you're listening well, you will catch the issues before they go out of hand. And information, information brings enlightenment and reduces conflict, all right? So if you carry them along, whatever the situation is, during the downturn, during the upturn, you profit share with them, and they, they, they know what's happening. They know the industry, because they, they've probably moved from one place to another, all right? So uh, you can't hoodwink them, all right? So, uh, and we were all part of, I mean, we, we grew up from somewhere. We're part of the lower um, management team and um, these union people, I mean, they will, they will become managers tomorrow. Okay, so they, they also understand what's happening. So it's about communicating, feeling the pulse of the, uh, of the employees and attending to matters before they get out of hand. Uh, my question is to Mr. Shegun. Uh, on the challenges of transporting equipment in West Africa, and it's a real challenge, right? And looking at things from your perspective as an IOC, what sort of improvements are we seeing? What sort of discussions are being had? I'll give an example. So I've got uh, an IOC customer who has a piece of equipment in Ghana as a spare, right? And they need it in Nigeria, same company. And we, we just can't get it out of here, right? So from your perspective, when we start thinking about overcoming transportation, li uh, licenses, all those kind of things that sort of don't enable us to be a bit smarter, don't en enable you as an IOC to be a bit smarter about how you spend your money, right? Are there any discussions being had with government? How are we thinking about transportation within West Africa? Because it's very hard. Yeah, indeed, it's a big challenge, uh, especially even in Nigeria. And uh, one of the things I think that we can do is, like I've rightly said, we need to partner with the communities. You know, I did mention something now that right there in Port Harcourt, there are a lot of people who have been engaged in the building of houseboats, the building of tugboats the building of badges. And when we are talking of marine logistics, these are the basic things that we need. So if we have local technology that can build all these things we are talking about, that can be used. One, you have helped to empower the communities. You have helped to empower the local communities and the youth. The youth restfulness will reduce you have equally brought in a lot of income into the country. Because by way of going outside to get all those equipment, you no longer do that. You use the locally made one. And they are very good because after the most have built all these badges and talk I'm talking about, they go for certification with other DPR, I mean, um, NIMASA or NIWA. NIWA is National Inland Waterways. They are in charge of every movement of equipment within the uh, waterways in, inside, the, inside the country, not outside. But when we are talking of moving from country to another country, 
Um, it's a big challenge because within Nigeria, when we look at land logistics, what we normally do, <clears throat> what is obtainable there is because of security problem. Security is a big challenge, like my colleague have rightly said. Reason because in the river, I mean, in the waterfront, we have a lot of boat mishap, boat hijack, we're out of piracy, even though it's getting reduced now. We used to experience that years back, 2015, 2016, you know, we have a lot of issues with that. But now, it has really come down because most of these guys that have engaged themselves in all this which I've mentioned about. But in the land aspect which I was about to make reference to, what is being done is they engage in the aspect of having a security personnel that escort, you know, to avoid any forms of uh, challenges. But in the water fraud, it becomes a problem. But I suggest, like I said, that if you can try to develop your local content like we have done in our country because any company coming to Nigeria now, like my colleague have rightly said, local content is one of the key, one of the key factors. And this has really helped a lot. So whereby instead of going outside to look for source of help, when you try to develop a people right in your country, I think it goes a long way. I just wanted to touch on one of the comments that uh, uh, was made, and we talked about you know, the experience and attracting talent and using talent locally. Um, I, I don't see it necessarily as a sub-Saharan African problem. It's an industry problem. Uh, in the business we're in, well-controlled business, we see firsthand the, the outcome of lack of experience. There's a reason that some of us have gray hairs, because we've been here a while. Uh, you can't fast-track experience. Uh, but one of the things, and you know, growing up in the UK, that there used to be trade schools, apprenticeships for electricians, plumbers, fitters, welders, and there's been a real shift to where in the millennial generation, everyone's saying, oh, I must go to university. So they go to university, they get a good degree in history, sociology, psychology, or whatever, and then they come out and they go, well, now I want to go and get a job that pays me money, I'll go into the oil industry. They have no experience. So is there a move in sub-Saharan? I mean, it needs to be, you know, globally, but to get back to an apprenticeship. So rather than singularly focusing on you know, the, the universities in your countries, what about the apprenticeship programs to where then maybe even the industry partners support that apprenticeship program to where you can actually grow grassroots people so that you get around that, well, I've been out of school for one year's experience. You've had a guy that's come in maybe at 16, 15 years old, and he's started on that apprenticeship route is, is that something that's a potential here that may be a, an easier solution than trying to fast track a, a, you know, a petroleum engineer? I, I don't believe we have uh, such uh, apprenticeship uh, schemes um, anymore. Uh, we do have um, polytechnics um, where people who have graduated high school um, go into, so maybe they're 18 when they get there, so they're coming out at 20. Uh, so they're coming out with what they call uh, ordinary uh, diplomas um, I, I think that you would find a pool of people in the right um, demographics, the right age uh, that you can train and you can absorb into the industry. Um, for Nigeria, I, I think yeah, you can find that. Um, I can't speak specifically to uh, what's happening in Ghana, um, but I do get your point. Uh, if you can catch them uh, young, then you can bring them into the industry and keep them and they can have long careers uh, adding value to the industry. Okay. Um I think that's a very, very, very valid point. Um, I, I share your view about the UK one, and that's something in sub-Saharan Africa is non-existent. Now, that's the part where I talk about engaging with the local stakeholders to put such schemes in place to help the industry grow to the right level. Um, in my experience, I'm very new to the industry, by the way. I'm only seven years in the industry. But in my experience, I've realized that it's not every role in my organization that you need an engineer or a degree holder to do the role. However, if you have the right apprentice scheme that develop them from, let's say, when they get into, in the UK, I would say year 12, which is, let's say, sixth form, or secondary school, 
you will realize that by the time they are at working class age, let's say 18 or 21, they have the right requisite experience, technical experience, that will accelerate their development into what we need in the industry. Now, which then means, as an industry, both the service companies and the IOCs needs to come together. And as my colleague said, either we lobby the local stakeholders to engage them to come to the understanding that that is the kind of scheme we need. Now, I'll give you a typical example. I had a meeting with somebody in this country whereby they were challenging me to use electrical electricians for one of our fly product lines because they think the, electric, the person doing the normal electrical fitting in the house can do or can be employed in that. And I'm saying, you don't understand it. It won't work. That's not the kind of technical abilities that I need. And because I don't have it, if you want to have it, the best way to do it is partner with me, bring these guys to come and develop. You pay them because I'm not going to add their cost to the organization's cost in order to get to the right level. Then when they get to the right level after three, four years, it makes it easier to then say, let's tap into that talent. Now, there's a scheme that some, um, another company have started doing at the moment. But funny enough, they've gone into recruit again, graduate from the universities. Um, I think we've even spoken to them as an organization where they've got this workshop, they put them into a scheme which is similar to apprenticeship. But it has to be taken on board by the local stakeholders. In the UK, apprenticeship was managed by the government and it was enforced on most of the organization to do it. Here is the case in most of South Saharan Africa. It doesn't exist. But that's where I said that then the local stakeholders expect you to turn around and increase the local content overnight. And then it makes it difficult because you can't put engineers or graduate engineers in every single role. You need the experience, you need the technical experience, not somebody who's just come from a um, university to come and do it. So I think it's a very, very, very valid point. If we can come together and engage and lobby the local stakeholders to understand that is what will upskill the individuals that we need and grow the talent in the, um, in the industry, it will really, really help. Now, I know in the case of Nigeria, obviously, again, there's massive talent. The industry has been in existence in the, for a long while, but the likes of Ghana, it's not there. Angola, it's not there. Um, you look at even some of the French countries, we don't have it. Now, the French countries, the French African country seems to have something similar to the apprenticeship scheme, but it doesn't develop them technically. It's a, I think it's an MVT, correct me if I'm wrong. It, it has an, um, something to do with the city and girls, but it's a, at a different level. And it, the idea is to train them into an university. So they, can, they kind of have that route. But we need to engage the local stakeholders for them to understand that this is what we need to get the industry to the right footings in some of these countries. Thank you. I want to say something about this. Hello? I want to say something about this. Okay. You know, so okay. that we probably don't leave here thinking nothing is happening in the industry about this. Uh, I, I like uh, the statement he made about what is happening in the UK. And uh, honestly, um, if you come to Nigeria, there is a lot of program that is there to train people to have skills in the apprenticeship level. I want to give examples. I know in the late 90s, around 1998, 99, Shell set up what he called the SITP program, Shell Intensive Training Program. There is the graduate level, and there is also the apprenticeship lower level for technical people. So you have the SITP one for graduates and the SITP two for those who have to do technical work. It ran for about 10 years, and uh, many of the companies in Nigeria actually benefited from it. These people were trained to use their hand, and they did clear apprenticeship program. It's a one-year program, which churned out a lot of people who are talented to work. And people were picked not because uh, they have a godfather or whatever. People were picked because they are interested to work, and they did the work. Presently also, we have what we call the PECTEN, Petroleum Industry in, uh, in Nigeria. PECTEN is also championing 
apprenticeship in different areas. They have the apprenticeship for welders, where they train people, they assign people even to companies. The Halliburton's probably some people who are, who, they assign them to companies to do hands-on work. And by the end of the one-year program, they are either picked by those companies to start working for them. So that program is ongoing. Also, the Society of Petroleum Engineering is championing a program where they also bring into bear that people should be trained from the grassroots. And that is why they have programs for high schools. So the SPE goes to different high schools to encourage young ones, talk to them. Yes, we've not probably had the, a, a, a government backing it up, but the IOCs that you have has also tried to do one or two things. I know one of the programs that uh, share around sometime called the Life Wire program. They get to the communities, get people, train them on skills that they can use in the industry. And that has been actually working. So those programs are still running. Some of them have stopped, like the SITP program, Share stopped it like about some few years back. But the Live Wire program that talks about, that looks at the, the uh, skills of uh, apprent uh, uh, apprenticeship skills is still running. You also have the Pentem programs that are still running. So these programs are running. What I think should happen is the fact that governments should come in and see how they can leverage on what the IOCs are already doing and then make it a lot more uh, sustainable so that it doesn't stop at a, a point in time. And that will churn out a number of uh, skills, even in the industry, as we go forward. And like my colleague uh, Shegu has actually mentioned, if you get to Nigeria, people who build the different vessels and boats you see are not people coming out from outside the country. It is people who have been trained in apprenticeship to do it locally in Nigeria. And I think when it's supported both by government and every other person, we'll probably achieve what we are looking at, especially not just in Nigeria, but in sub-Saharan Africa. Precisely when uh, the young man was talking, what just came to my spirit was the live wire he mentioned, which is still running. Quite a, no a lot of people have been benefited from it, and is a way of empowering the communities which we are talking about. And it's part of what we call social performance, under the program we call social performance by SPDC to the communities. I think uh, these are laudable programs that could be done also in Ghana, which will help to empower the youth, and then at the same time help to, for them to know where their skills lies and be able to tap into it, and then flow in that line. Just like you said, it's not only when you have the certificate and when you finish, you start looking for a job. But when you're able to identify your skill at the initial stage, you flow into it. And before you know, you become an MD of your own company. Like most of the people we have talked about now in LifeWire, majority of them are MD of their own company because when you are done, the company empowers with some little amount of money for you to, uh, to, to establish yourself, which I think is really working well for quite a number of people. And this has subjected a lot of, uh, reduced the rate of youthful exuberances and uh, all those problems that we used to have among the youths, especially in Nigeria now. Thank you. So uh, just to add to what's been said already, uh, the Nigerian government does have a program. It's called the Empower Program, all right? It's uh, specifically uh, made for apprenticeship uh, experience. All right, I believe they've trained about 500,000 now, part of the major problem we have in Nigeria is not just having graduates, it's having graduates that have skill to um, employable skill, all right, um, and some ex level of experience. So that is one of the solutions that's there, not just for graduates. Uh, there's, a, there's one for high school gra graduates as well, okay? So um, it's, it's kind of a cultural shift for us in Nigeria. The school system, the schooling system doesn't encourage a lot of... Um, practical experience while you're there, all right? Um, there are very few, if you look at the population of Nigeria to the oil companies, how many of the uh, graduates or the uh, interns, how many interns can we absorb? Very few, all right, to gain experience while they're still in school, all right? There's a three months training program, there's a six months training program, and even there's a youth service program which is totally uh, been um, marginalized from uh, the oil field experience now by uh, the governments, okay? But previously, that used to, those uh, one year, nine months, used to give exposure to uh, students to the, uh, to have practical experience, not just, um, you know, on paper 
classroom experience. So um, I guess um, it's work in progress. It's a kind of uh, change in um, our, our way of thinking. Uh, we need to lobby and work with the government. We need to lobby and work with the system to get what we want out of it. You know, we as leaders in um, the companies we work in, we need to be able to influence our society by creating the right environments for us to get the right people with the right attitude, with the right training. I think it's part of our social corporate responsibilities. And um, I believe we're all doing that, but we need to work harder at it. Uh, part of the problem we've faced and the challenge we've really faced has to do with the um, cyclic nature of our industry, the upturn and downturn. All right, so you mentioned the SITP um, program being shut down. I mean, that's a laudable program, but because of funding, they had to shut it down. All right, and even because of funding, it was first in, what's it called? First in, first out, right? Yeah, so you train those guys, and before you know it, you're laying them off again. All right, and then you rehire them, and then you're laying them off again. So nobody really, so they, they're all tired of it. Uh, the experienced guys to a tide of the cyclic nature. You see people who have a lot of experience not coming back to the industry, saying, I've had enough after this cycle. I'm going back to do something that I can predict. Okay, so we see that happening as well. So I guess it's, it's the nature of our industry, unfortunately. Um, but we have to th think beyond um, these challenges and find solutions for them. Um, and um, also work within our means, okay? Uh, you can't grow too fast, all right? Um, you need to plan ahead uh, for these uh, dry seasons so that you're not laying off people unnecessarily. You need to um, um, put in place shock absorbers for these periods of downturn, all right? Because they are people, they have families, they have livelihood, all right? And um, I, I think by, by Thinking broad, broadly about how to accommodate uh, the shocks we, we receive, we'll be able to do better, act better, and uh, give better to society and our people. Just a point of uh, correction a bit on the SITP issue. Uh, you may not believe, but uh, it's true to say that once the training is completed, the company look out for the best among the graduates. Now, it might shock you to hear that the rest are always being picked by other companies because they believe they have been trained by Shell. And once they have been trained by Shell, they already have the know-how to work. So they go for those other people whom we call remnants. But Shell go for the best. So the rest, they are not losing out. They still get themselves fixed in other companies. I know quite a number of people who get themselves fixed in different companies after they have been trained. Because these people already have the technical know-how by the reason of the training they have. So with this, they still get themselves engaged and they're not useless. They're not just there. So somehow, the work continues. And that is how the cycling movement has been moving all this while before the issue of light wire came in. Thank you. Okay, um, just to add to what they've said, and I'm not going to contradict anything that has been said, but what I'm about to say may come across a bit controversial. Let's be honest. We are talking about sub-Saharan Africa, where our government, our local government, wants to depend on the oil companies and the service companies to train their indigenous people to take over the companies. Meanwhile, they give scholarship for people selectively to go in to do human resource, oil and gas, finance, oil and gas, and all that outside the countries, the native countries. My view is this. Instead of depending on the shells, the experts, the talos, and the rest to do the training for you, come up with these schemes, the apprentice schemes, as a nationwide program. Identify them. Channel that scholarship, money that you send them outside, into training facility that would develop these people Give them the assimilators or the training in country in order to get them to the right level. That's what I mean by let's lobby the stakeholders because they have the funds, but they want to depend on the companies to do it for them. And then when they are done, they want you to pay them on top of that. I'm a human resource person, so I'm talking from a human resource perspective. 
Let me give you a typical example. When we hired majority of the people in Angola, scholarship were given to them from the government to go and study outside. And majority of them was not even in technical experience. They were, these were in support functions. Meanwhile, where we need the people is in the technical environment. As we say in our organization, the ops people makes the money for the business. So invest in the operational people, the technical people. Get them at that level where you will be able, the companies will go, I'm not going to go outside to hire from outside the country. I'm going to hire in the country because I have the prerequisite skills in the country. But we don't do it. And if we don't start engaging them to own up to their responsibilities, we will keep training them. And as it happens all the time, when, and as it's, as it's been said already, when it gets to downtime, some of the companies will go, I'm not going to do it again. Now, you talked about the youth service, right? We have the same thing in Ghana. It's in the national service scheme. Now, that's one of the things we've used recently. But the national service scheme, really and truthfully, doesn't give them any qualification. It gives them internal practice or training that the company has provided. The same thing is in Nigeria. The youth scheme service. They finish university, mostly, or college. They go to companies to do what we call, in the UK, as attachment. They do attachment for six months, nine months. When you think you feel they are good, you absorb them in. However, what qualification do they gain? If you put the apprentices in place, whilst they are going each step, they get different qualification. City and Guild 1, there's 2, there's 3, man handling tools, one, two. I come from a company called Network Rail in the UK. And we benefited from this apprentice scheme because we didn't need to have experienced engineers to you do it. We picked them up, we trained them as part of the apprentice scheme. And when the majority of them, as he said it, stay with us for the rest of their life. I know somebody, I know one of my DU managers that came to us at the age of 16. And we still kept his notes from his head teacher. His head teacher wrote, we always used to laugh with him. His head teacher wrote, don't employ this guy. He's one of the naughtiest people in my class. That's a fact. We kept it. When he was leaving, we added to one of the things we gave it to him as a um, living present. But he benefited from the apprentice scheme and became a DU director. And he was excellent. People management, delivery of the things, everything. When we invest like that, we engage the local stakeholders to understand the benefits of that. Instead of sending people to the UK, to the America, to do all these things, and then they want to come back and come and do the top level management job without growing the basic, the basis. How do we get the industry to grow in our sub-Saharan region? I rest my case. Uh, hello, Billy with JDR again. Uh, just wanted to return back to question number three um, here about the movement of equipment within uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's uh, 460 kilometers from the center of Lagos to this hotel room. That's uh, less than the size of the state of Texas. Um, in theory, I could drive from Lagos to this, uh, this hotel in under 10 hours. Uh, but if I have equipment, spares, uh, in Lagos and I need them here, uh, it, it's going to take weeks upon weeks if I can get them out of Lagos to bring them here. Uh, I know it's a long road uh, to being able to share equipment and spares and resources throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, but where, what are the first steps? We have to start, you know, the journey of a thousand steps starts with, with one, right? So we, we, what are the first steps that we can take to start sharing spares and equipment resources um, owned by the same companies uh, amongst locations in this wonderful region? Well, I, I think the solution for that goes beyond uh, just the industry. Um, so I've heard this afternoon, um, many people have talked about um, security situations uh, in various countries. Um, in Nigeria, you have that security situation um, in the creeks, uh, you have it up north. 
you have it pretty much everywhere. Uh, kidnapping right now, in, uh, even it's on the rise in the Southwest. Um, limited opportunities for people. Um, uh, because of that, you are getting, uh, you, know, you know, crime is rising. Um, there's this trend, or there was this trend around the world for uh, countries to come together. Uh, you were talking about Brexit. You had the European Union, and now that's uh, threatening uh, to be fractured. Same thing in Africa, Africa Union. Um, also, the African Free Trade Act, um, we, which, um, uh, which is many, many com countries in, in Africa are coming together to make uh, free trade um, easy uh, amongst the countries. Uh, Nigeria hasn't signed up uh, to that. Uh, Nigeria is the largest, uh, uh, when you talk about uh, the market for oil and gas in Africa, if Nigeria doesn't sign up to that, uh, you can see how difficult it's going to be to uh, implement. Um, uh, you made a good point about uh, the distance from Nigeria to Ghana. That would be a trip of 10 hours, uh, like you said. Um, but this calls for investment, right? Uh, investments not just within the country, but across the continent. Um, but we have to look at where we are, even within the country, even within Nigeria. Uh, you, lot of, you have uh, a lot of highways begging uh, to be constructed. Uh, and if that can be done just within one country, then you can imagine the scale of the problem uh, when you try to do it across uh, multiple countries. So that's something that goes beyond um, what we can legislate uh, in this room. Um, I guess the only thing we can do is to lobby the governments and see if we can get um, you know, special concessions uh, to make uh, movement of goods and services uh, easier. If I can make a quick contribution to that. Uh, it, it is more in the hands of the governments in the region than in the hands of the uh, operators. However, what we could do is to constitute a critical mass in lobbying them. Uh, unfortunately, DPR is not here right now. But I think we might be inching in that direction, although very slowly. Uh, a good example is in West Africa now, we have what is called West African passport. Uh, and that's what I traveled to Ghana on. Uh, yes, um, I, I couldn't renew my Nigerian passport on time. And I was told I could get, I got it in less than an hour, you know. So regional integration is the solution, but uh, we're moving very slowly, but the industry has to use bodies like uh, DPR and uh, other similar authorities to lobby the governments to see the value in regional integration, and uh, we will get there someday. Just to add to that, um, we have the West African, then we have the CIMAC, and then even when it comes to, CIMAC is most of the um, Central um, African countries. Um, so the likes of Congo, Gabon, Chad, and the rest, they can free travel um, when it comes to people. So, people, and you're right. We are able to do the people one, but we find it extremely difficult to do the equipment one. And in our industry, with our equipment, how are we going to work? You know? So, again, back to doing the right engagement sessions. We need to find a way for them to understand this kind of challenges. Because without that, it makes it difficult. If I have a simple contract, again, in Nigeria, and I have equipment in Nigeria, which I can use in Ghana, and as I said, it's a 10 minutes drive. We can put it on a long track, drive it down to get the work done. But would the equipment leave Nigeria? I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna go there. I'll talk about the people one, <laughs> but the logistics one, I'll let it remain. So, I think we need to find a way to engage the right stakeholders to understand this is a huge problem. And with the industry picking up in this region, in a few of the hotspots, we need to be able to move equipment easily. Just like we are able to move people around. You know, even when it goes to Angola, now Angolans can go to South Africa with their visa, South Africans can go to Angola with their visa, and those kind of things. Same as Angola, Mozambique, you know. I know this because of the people part. But the equipment part, I have no idea. And I know that my 
business colleagues, business managers have a huge challenge with that. But we need to find a way to engage the right people to get them to understand we need a solution. And quick. Thank you, Chris. Well, thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks uh, for your participation in uh, obviously a topic that uh, probably deserves a, a conference on its own. On, um, but yeah, definitely getting the regulators uh, in this. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the day. I hope I have been a reasonable chairman for uh, <laughs> for, the, for this uh, first day. I mean, for me, it's, it, I have to say it's been great um, looking at uh, what uh, Faye mentioned in the uberization of the industry, which I guess goes along the what has just been discussed um, around resources. Um, but also the, the technology that has been presented. Um, certainly the, uh, the well intervention needs all that flexibility. Um, very pleased to, to actually see what uh, BP did in Angola, uh, clearly um, opening the door to, uh, to a rise in activity in terms of uh, well intervention over there, um, which I'm sure Nigeria is, is also of a high demand for, for the same. So, um, thanks, uh, thanks for being patient. Uh, I think you said it that we had to be patient. So, thanks, th thanks to all.